1945. War comes to Germany. The total war strikes back at the Germans in all its drama to reach its climax on German soil. 100 days of death and terror. There were moments, of course, before the Allies had crossed the Rhine. There were fears that the war could even go on into 1946. The Allies conquer the Third Reich. For many, these 100 days were simply a struggle for life or death. Survival or destruction. One can only imagine the horror of these final days. For Hitler, it was clear that he would kill himself. The only question was when. Hitler's end in the bunker. The downfall. The last hundred days were certainly the most terrible in the entire war for Germany and the German people. The Germans capitulate unconditionally. January 28, 1945, still 100 days before war's end. A landscape in Poland, west of the River Vistula. This region has been occupied by the Germans since the Wehrmacht conquered Poland in September 1939. 28th of January, 1945. Despite a heavy snowstorm, 3,800 Soviet tanks and one and a half million Red Army soldiers break through the Wehrmacht's defense lines. The war has long since been decided to Germany's disadvantage. The Germans made a final offensive in the West, which foundered. But at the end of January 1945, the Allies in the West and East are still on the borders of the Reich. Germany's defeated, but not yet occupied. Day and night, Stalin's troops steadily advance, euphoric and sure of victory. Those who stand in their way are crushed. The Wehrmacht doesn't have a chance. German troops still hold Denmark and Norway, as well as parts of Italy and Holland. In the west, the Allies have taken Alsace and the Ardennes. In the east, the Red Army has reached the Oder. The goal of the Red Army's January offensive was to obliterate what was left of the Wehrmacht within a few weeks. For it was clear to the Red Army High Command that the Germans would run out of reserves to send to the Eastern Front, since they had used up the last of them in the Ardennes Offensive in late 1944, early 1945. Basically, the Wehrmacht no longer had a functioning Luftwaffe, nor was it being provided with supplies, so the Red Army thought the job would now be easy. A newsreel screened in German cinemas portrays the heroic resistance of German soldiers against a superior foe. Basically, the Wehrmacht had only one remaining unit that was able to resist attack. It was still relatively good at that, militarily, compared to the Red Army, but was no longer a serious enemy. The first pictures from the battles in the east. After unusually heavy fire, masses of tanks supported by a strong air force attack our front with well over a hundred Bolshevik infantry divisions. Continual fire from all German units is causing enormous losses to the Bolshevik divisions. The situation particularly on the Eastern Front, is the most important because on the 28th of January, they were only three days from crossing the Oder and establishing bridgeheads across the Oder. Certainly from that point, the Wehrmacht had no chance of winning the war or even really of defending Germany. Hitler was refusing to bring back troops from the Courland uh, pocket. Uh, he was bringing, refusing to bring back troops from uh, Norway, where there were some 400,000 German troops. So from that point of view, the frustration of uh, German generals that uh, they were to defend Germany to the end, and yet they didn't have the forces which they could have uh, to do it. Amateur photographs of the so-called Kurland army cut off in Latvia show the true state of many Wehrmacht units 
there is a lack of weapons, equipment and supplies. But there seems no alternative to fighting. From a rational point of view, it's difficult to understand why the soldiers continue to fight. In January alone, almost half a million German soldiers died, more than ever before in one month. But they still fought on. Why? Because they were used to it. Many had fought for years. They didn't know any different. And the principle of dying for your country also applied. It was a great honor to die in war and was so ingrained that many thought that's the way it had to be. That's why we continue to fight. The same was true for the people, who still believed in ultimate victory. Partly because of the propaganda, of course, but as it became ever more clear it wasn't going to work, they just didn't want to accept it. Whatever people have in their cupboards and drawers that they don't absolutely need is brought to the collection points. It's for our soldiers and Volkssturm men, and thus for you, in the fight for Germany. Nazi propaganda shows footage of the so-called Volkssturm, or Home Guard, as once in the liberation wars of Prussia, the men of this militia are now to defend the home ground of the German Reich. I believe that the Nazi leadership already knew that the war was lost. The question now is what to do. Surrender is out of the question. So once again, all reserves must be mobilized. But what was still left? Only the old. That's all. Normal weapons and not a chance. All they can do is believe and hate and hope that that will be enough to turn the tide. But the Volkssturm is barely trained and weakly armed. It can do little to oppose the Soviet army. Which is why, on January 28, 1945, Adolf Hitler orders the Wehrmacht and Volkssturm to form mixed combat groups under unified leadership. Panic is not yet rife in the cities along the Oder. According to a military propaganda report on the mood of the people, the rapid Soviet advance at first seems overwhelming. It should be noted that the population is not yet aware of the strength of the advancing troops. In Breslau, Gauleiter Karl Hanke turns up with Ferdinand Schoener, a National Socialist fanatic. General Schoener, Hitler's favorite commander, was basically talking about strength through fear and already this sort of uh, terrifying series of executions of deserters and uh, anybody who retreated without orders was starting to begin. Nevertheless, many soldiers and Volkssturm men decide to save their own lives rather than die for Hitler, preferring to go into Soviet captivity. Marshal Konev's T-34 and Stalin tanks advanced towards Breslau without encountering any significant resistance. Soviet cameramen filmed these scenes in Lower Silesia. As a soldier writes in his journal, Our tanks crushed everything in their path. Their tracks flattened carts, horses, and everything else in the road. Understandably, reports from the refugees are depressing, yet some of them, despite their experiences, express confidence that the Führer will soon return them to their homes. On the one hand, we know that the civilian population was tossed to and fro. There's often initial flight, then the people return, assuming they can stay. Then they flee again, or just miss the time to take flight. Then the Red Army invades. Usually the first troops to arrive, they say, tread relatively lightly. But the second to arrive, plunder, commit acts of violence, even sexual abuse against German women. As a Red Army officer notes, Rightly, the Germans are running from us as from the plague. Our people invaded their homes like a pack of Huns. Such excesses were probably due to the anger that the peasant soldiers felt against the Germans' complacency about the wealth in which they lived. In their letters home, simple Red Army soldiers wrote, 
There's water coming out of the wall. They have porcelain and curtains on their windows. What in God's name did they want from us? And then came an incredible rage and bitterness against this Nazi Germany that invaded the Soviet Union, plundered its last provisions, destroyed the infrastructure and overran the land with a brutal war of annihilation. On this, the 28th of January, 1945, 100 days before war's end, a young German writes to her husband, who is serving in the Luftwaffe. The worst is just sitting around and waiting, waiting for what the future will bring. You know, if I were a man, I'd fight for as long as I could. Fred, don't say we could possibly be overrun by the Russians. In Moscow, Joseph Stalin seems satisfied with the Red Army's major attack. Only rarely does he interfere in military decisions. Konyev's forces basically knew their order was to advance as far as possible to cause absolute confusion uh, and basically to panic the German forces into a retreat. Stalin, when he briefed Marshal Konyev, had pointed to Silesia and put a circle around it with his finger and said, gold. Basically, the order was, do not destroy the industries. Near Krakow, the chemical factories of E. Gay Farben also fall into the hands of the Red Army. As they advance, a reconnaissance patrol discovers a campsite with hundreds of barracks, fenced in with barbed wire. Its name becomes the symbol of the Holocaust, Auschwitz-Birkenau. On the 28th of January, 1945, a hastily summoned camera team takes the first aerial shots of the site. A Soviet commission inspects the barracks. Of the once 58,000 inmates, only 8,000 are still in the camp. Too weak to be transported, they had been left to die. Investigators also discover a complex that had apparently been blown up by the Nazis. The gas chambers of Auschwitz-Birkenau, where about a million European Jews were murdered. It will be long, however, before the world finds out. Stalin, or the communist Stalin and the communist leadership had no interest at all in highlighting the fate of a specific group of victims, unless the victims were citizens of the Soviet Union instead of Jews. That's why from the very beginning, the official language was not Jews were killed here, only Soviet citizens. It is over one year later when these pictures of the children of Auschwitz go public in the Nuremberg trials of Nazi Germany's major war criminals. January 29th, 1945. 99 days before war's end. The Hürtgen Forest, west of Aachen. Since the end of the Battle of the Bulge in late January 1945, US troops have been fighting their way forwards in impassable terrain, progress is slow. Bitter warfare has been raging here for months. More than 20,000 lives are lost. Now, US units are massing to push further into Hitler's Reich. The Wehrmacht's resistance has not yet been broken, but time and again, entire units surrender. The commanding general reports to the headquarters. The soldier in the West has had his fill of war. In the West, the Allies have liberated parts of Holland and crossed the border of the Reich at Aachen. The front line runs farther south through the Eiffel region. The next major target is the Rhine. Dwight D. Eisenhower, Commander-in-Chief of the Allied Expeditionary Forces, knows that the Wehrmacht is hardly able to move and of low combat strength. Nevertheless, he chooses to advance carefully and step by step. Eisenhower's strategy was still to close up to the River Rhine before making serious attempts to cross it. 
There is tremendous tension between the British and Eisenhower, partly frustration at uh, the way that Eisenhower even was assuming that he would not get across the Rhine until the month of May because he felt that the river uh, would be so high. And um, tremendous uh, frustration, particularly, of course, on the part of Montgomery, who was still arguing that he should lead the main attack into Germany through the north. Field Marshal Bernard L. Montgomery is confident about the Americans. He orders the British and Canadian troops to advance. But against all expectations, the Wehrmacht does not retreat behind the Rhine after its defeat in the Ardennes and fights fiercely against His Majesty's troops. The Nazis use leaflets to incite the Rhineland to fanatically persevere. Against the intentions of our enemies, there is only one thing. Fight to the death with all means, with every weapon, with the last of your strength. In London, the British politicians are condemned to inaction. Prime Minister Winston Churchill has no influence on Eisenhower's military decisions. However, he intervenes time and again. In this wartime alliance, the Americans were the dominant partner. Usually they got their way. And I think a lot of the friction between Montgomery and Eisenhower arose from the fact that these were two alpha males um, uh, who, however, had very different uh, sort of armies and power potential behind them. Churchill's role, I mean, in a sense, uh, he accepted that Eisenhower and the Americans were the dominant people. He tried to manipulate them into adopting ideas of his own, but he wasn't always successful with that. The War Cabinet meets in the bomb-proof war rooms under the Foreign Ministry. For the British capital is still threatened by the so-called wonder weapons, which claim numerous lives in London. Especially feared are the V1 and the V2. We bring you the first recordings of the V2 on their flight to England. For reasons of secrecy, they were taken from a greater distance and give only a weak idea of their actual size. At breakneck speed, the slender steel body rises into the stratosphere. So-called retaliatory weapons are to turn the tide. The V-2 catches its victims completely by surprise at supersonic speed. Nazi propaganda shows footage of older men training with bazookas. The Germans are nevertheless insecure. Rumors, ceasefire negotiations between Germany and the Anglo-Americans are said to be underway with the aim of bringing the Eastern offensive to a halt. The Führer has been given an ultimatum to capitulate by January the 31st, 1945. Otherwise, Germany would be crushed. There is no real information policy. Rumor plays an immense role. And rumor is interesting because it shows what is considered possible. The hope for miracle weapons or all kinds of perfidious plans of the Allies. Rumors are very interesting in this respect. But of course, most people don't really know how things stand at the front, the reality of the situation, and how could they? And you construct your reality from the information and your own identity. That is very important. After all, there are those who considered the war lost early on because they didn't commit themselves to the state in the same way as others. And for those who did commit themselves to the state and also linked it with social advancement, including material prosperity, it's difficult for them to admit it's all over. So they often hold on to their belief until the first T-34 is parked in their backyard. The Soviet general's plan to sever Eastern Prussia from the rest of Germany succeeds. His troops put pressure on the remaining German armies and start grinding them down. The Red Army has, meanwhile, conquered large parts of East Prussia and is marching towards Königsberg. Only the harbour in Pilar and the frozen Vistula Lagoon offer the possibility of escape. 
The Nazis have banned all evacuation. High-ranking party leaders are secretly making a bolt for it and leaving the people to their fate. Millions flee, far too late and in utter chaos. Gauleiter Erich Koch, a member of the NSDP since 1922, is a fervent supporter of Hitler. With Koch, we had a particularly fanatical Nazi at the top in East Prussia. Koch delayed the evacuation order as long as he could, saying it could lead to a demoralization of the Wehrmacht if the civilian population had already been evacuated. Conversely, it means that the civilian population has actually been abandoned to the Red Army. Ignoring all prohibitions, the people now make their way to the West. On this January the 29th, 1945, 99 days before war's end, Nazi officials estimate that about 4 million Germans are on the run. Two weeks later, that number has risen to 7 million. At the end of January, the cross-country escape route is blocked in East Prussia. The civilian population has only two options. One is to try to make it to the harbors and catch one of the ships that will take them to the west. And the other is to flee across the lagoon in horse-drawn carts. We know from eyewitness accounts that this was a highly dangerous route. For as soon as one moved from thicker to the thinner layers of ice, there was the danger of it cracking. Horse-drawn wagons fell through into the freezing water, and people also died. January 30th, 1945, 98 days before war's end. The destination of most refugees is the Baltic Sea coast near Danzig. Here, in January 1945, the war is still far away. And in the ports, people are hoping to find passage on a ship that will take them to a safer part of the Reich. At this time, Nazi propaganda circulates footage of transports across the Baltic Sea that appear to be orderly. In the ports themselves, conditions were, of course, chaotic. They weren't equipped for the arrival of such large numbers of people in such a short space of time. And those who came were, naturally, desperate. Whenever a ship docked, everyone fought for a place, if not for themselves, then for their children. And there must have been some really turbulent scenes. All available vessels are ordered into port. On this day, the Wilhelm Gusloff is also moored in Gdynia, near Danzig. The Wilhelm Gustloff, a former Nazi craft durch Freude, strength through joy cruise liner, was later converted into a hospital ship. But then, like so many other things, it was requisitioned during the war as a troop carrier. But on this day, there were predominantly refugees on board to be brought to safety. As a cruise liner, the Gustloff was equipped to take no more than 1,500 passengers and 400 crew. But on this, the 30th of January, 1945, there are almost 10,000 people on board. Shortly after 3 p.m., the British Secret Service reports that the Wilhelm Gusloff has left Gdynia. From the fortress Breslau, the capital of the Gau Silesia region is a bulwark against the Bolshevik onslaught. The people of Breslau are called upon by its Gauleiter to defend the city to the last man. Manpower and bazookas stop every tank. Silesia's capital makes propaganda-ready preparations for the Red Army attack. Breslau is defended by 24,000 Wehrmacht soldiers and the men of the People's Army. Anti-tank barriers are prepared to make the impossible possible. Those who refuse to follow orders are punishable by death. On this, the 30th of January, 1945, 98 days before war's end, the Nazi era's most costly film opens in the cinemas. Kohlberg is to strengthen the Germans' resolve to endure. <laughs> 
Deutsche! Keine Freude ist süßer als die Freude der Freiheit. Aber ihr wisst, was uns blüht, wenn wir diesen Kampf nicht ehrenvoll gewinnen. Darum, welche Opfer von dem Einzelnen auch gefordert werden mögen, sie wiegen die heiligen Güter nicht auf, für die wir kämpfen und siegen müssen. It was designed to engender a sense of national resistance, of popular resistance against an invading army. And the uh, historical um, precedent of Kohlberg, the fortress on the Pomeranian coast that held out against the French in 1806-7, um, of course, was an ideal example. And you've got some of the big names in German uh, cinema, Heinrich Georg and Christina Zoderbaum, playing the, the key roles there. This was the you know big cinema, and it was designed to bring the, the crowds into the uh, into the cinemas. Uh, to instill a sense of national emergency and that it was now a, a, a matter of individual civilians uh, doing their bit for the fatherland. The irony, of course, is that it didn't work. People didn't, didn't go and see the film. Um, they went to see something else. On this, the 30th of January, 1945, a team of radio technicians enters the Reich Chancellery in Berlin. On the 12th anniversary of the Nazis' rise to power in 1933, Adolf Hitler is to speak on the radio. Und unwandelbar und treu dem Gebot der Erhaltung unserer Nation zu gehorchen. That was his last public appearance, but he was urged to at least speak on the radio and at least on the 30th of January, which he couldn't avoid. He always spoke on the 30th of January. This date was important, and it was a final attempt to sing the same old song, to strengthen the destiny, the hope, the V-weapons, the morale of a population that had already endured so much and to reinforce the people's faith that, in the end, everything would be all right. My darling Inge, at 10 p.m. the Führer will speak. I am consumed with joy and tears fill my eyes in gratitude that we have our Führer, who raises us so high above all, and he would not be ours were we to stand lower than they. Allmächtige hat unser Volk geschaffen. Indem wir seine Existenz verteidigen, verteidigen wir sein Werk. Dass diese Verteidigung mit namenlosem Unglück, Leid und Schmerzen sondergleichen verbunden ist, lässt uns nur noch mehr an uns diesem Volk hängen. Es lässt uns aber auch jene Härte gewinnen, die notwendig ist, um auch in schlimmsten Krisenpunkten unsere Pflicht zu erfüllen. Gibt deshalb in diesem Schicksalskampf für uns nur ein Gebot. Wer Ehren abkämpft, kann damit das Leben für sich und seine Lieben retten. Wer der Nation aber fein oder charakterlos in den Rücken fällt, wird unter allen Umständen eines schöpften Todes sterben. As ever, it was wonderful to hear the Führer's voice. How heavy must be his burden. Seen thus, it is almost painful to hear the Führer's words, hoping for a decision, but one has in fact been taken. No miracle will save us, except that of German perseverance. The dictator's speech is heard by Germans throughout the Third Reich, even on the Wilhelm Gusloff. Although the captain of the former cruise ship is aware of the danger from Soviet submarines, he has decided against a coastal route. With approximately 10,000 passengers on board, the ship must sail through deep water. Shortly after the end of the radio broadcast, a Soviet submarine approaches. The ship was struck by three torpedoes and sank within a very short space of time. And there must have been dramatic scenes on board. 
There were people below deck who couldn't get out. There were people trapped in the ship's swimming pool, mainly nurses, who couldn't get out. The deck was iced over. Lifeboats were frozen. It was the middle of winter, of course. The Baltic Sea was freezing cold, two degrees. Anyone who fell into the water died instantly. Survivors say they don't know how they did. There was little chance of getting through it in one piece. Those who didn't drown froze to death. Stern up, the Wilhelm Gusloff sinks into the Baltic Sea. A horrific sight for the survivors, floating on the water in rafts and boats. It is over two weeks before the German people learn of the disaster. The newspaper, Nachrichten für die Truppe, News for the Troops, reports that the refugee ship sank within 15 minutes. 932 passengers were rescued. The number of dead is estimated at 7,000. Corpses were washed up on the coast of Gdansk Bay. Exactly how many victims claimed by the tragedy is still unclear. February 3rd, 1945, 94 days before war's end. The former anti-aircraft towers at the Humboldt Hain in Berlin. During World War II, the reinforced concrete blocks were to protect the city center from British and US air raids. 12.8 centimeter twin guns are mounted on the tower, able to fire 28 rounds per minute. In the early morning of this, the 3rd of February, 1945, US B-17 bombers are readied for takeoff in Southeast England. More than a thousand of these planes are to fly to Hitler's capital as part of Operation Thunderclap. Operation Thunderclap, which actually had been prepared the year before, uh, was then revived at the beginning of 1945. The idea was really to aim for marshalling yards uh, and above all for main railway junctions. And this came partly at the pressure from the Soviet side because they were afraid that after the ending of the Ardennes Offensive, uh, Hitler was going to transfer most of his forces back to the Eastern Front. Never before had the Allies sent such a huge fleet of bombers to Berlin in broad daylight. But this time, the goal is a decapitation. The question is, how do we get the Germans to capitulate? The war has been won, but now it must come to an end. And then came the idea of air raid. That is, directing all Allied bombers to hit the Germans at once, in the center of Berlin by day, in the government quarter. That was the concept, and the idea of actually beheading the leadership of the Reich and hopefully destroying its nerve center, the ministries, the administrative authorities, and thereby massively complicating further warfare. It is precisely two minutes past 11 when the first aircraft drops its deadly load. There's hardly any resistance worth mentioning, and the Americans are virtually able to fly in school-style formation. The weather's relatively good, so one can take accurate aim. The guns on the anti-aircraft tower can do very little. In 51 minutes, more than 2,000 tons of bombs fall on Berlin. Entire districts are reduced to rubble. A UFA cameraman is filming in Berlin's city center on this, the 3rd of February, 1945. Approximately 2,500 people are killed in the air raid. Among them, a particularly fanatical Nazi. While trying to cross the courtyard of the People's Court, Roland Freisler is hit by a piece of shrapnel. In the course of his career, the murderous judge ruled or confirmed over 2,600 death sentences. The siblings, Hans and Sophie Scholl, were also among his victims. Roland Freisler was certainly symbolic of the Nazi judiciary, the blood judge par excellence, the chairman of the People's Court. He was well known for the trials against the assassins of July 20th, that is, the associated conspiracy, and his temper tantrums were notorious. <laughs> Ein Schäbiger Lump! 
Chrysler stands for a judiciary that is fully in the service of the system, that turns against all traitors to the people and is not sparing with the death sentence. One day before the air raid, Freisler passed four sentences, including that against Rudiger Schleicher, the Assistant Secretary of State. His brother, a physician, is just on his way to court. Rolf Schleicher can only confirm the death of the executioner in judges' robes. A telegram to Reich leader Martin Bormann states, I hereby inform you that the president of the People's Court, Dr. Freisler, was killed in today's terror attack on Berlin. The actual goal of eliminating government headquarters in Hitler's capital has foundered. Instead, that same day, Berlin's Anhalter railway station is almost completely destroyed. According to a report by the Wehrmacht propaganda, the mood of the Berliners is solemn and despondent. They want to keep the faith and hope for a good end to the war, but can no longer find much cause for hope. Yalta, 3rd of February, 1945, 94 days before war's end, Winston Churchill lands in the Crimea. The British Prime Minister is greeted by US President Franklin D. Roosevelt. They hope to negotiate with Joseph Stalin about the future. The wartime alliance, of course, was held together by one thing, and that was Adolf Hitler. So they had a common enemy, and that's what held this alliance together. So the objective number one was to win the war in Europe, then to win the war in uh, East Asia. Uh, but it was also clear that um, Soviet interests and Western interests were not necessarily the same. It was equally clear that British interests and American interests were not necessarily the same. Churchill hopes that victory over Hitler will also be a victory for freedom. Yet he also knows that should Joseph Stalin assert his claim to Central Europe and the Balkans, then freedom in the eastern part of the continent will take generations. Of symbolic significance was the fact that there the Soviet Union was able to present itself as the most important of the three powers, because Stalin was the host and because he could appear to be setting the conditions. And this conference basically emphasized the Soviet Union's importance and significance as a participant, probably the most important in the war arena. The so-called Big Three agree on a post-war order for Germany with occupied zones and reparations. President Roosevelt announces the withdrawal of all US troops from Europe after victory. Throughout the duration of the war, Stalin was always worried that the Western powers would cut him out. He did not trust Churchill. He probably trusted Roosevelt more than Churchill, but he didn't trust Churchill at all. And it was constantly mentioned, and always in the air, that the Allies would eventually come to an understanding with the Germans. The Allies did everything to counter this mistrust by always declaring, in anticipatory deference, that anything even resembling a partial surrender was out of the question. As Hitler's adversaries come together for the final group photo after days of negotiations, Stalin has prevailed against Churchill. Roosevelt is satisfied. The Soviet Union will enter the war against Japan and participate in founding the United Nations. February 13th, 1945, 84 days before war's end. From the Oder floodplains, it is only 75 kilometers to Berlin. If the Wehrmacht does not make a stand here, the Red Army will soon attack the capital. Soviet units are holding a broad front on the Oder on this the 13th of February, 1945. They besiege Kustrin, Glogau, Breslau and Poznan. At the same time, the Red Army is advancing on Danzig. Hitler has ordered a counter-offensive and so the newsreels repeatedly show footage of units taking up position. The Heeresgruppe Weichsel, or Vistula Army Guard, is mustered to thwart a Soviet attack on Berlin. But their commander-in-chief has little military experience. Hitler 
had started to become obsessed with the idea that he could not trust uh, army generals anymore. Uh, and when it came to appointing a commander in chief of um, Heroes Group of Axel, he was tempted or was persuaded to appoint Himmler, which was a disastrous appointment. Himmler had been um, no good as the commander uh, on the Upper Rhine when commanding a small army group there. The SS chief is completely overwhelmed. In meetings with his staff officers, he makes the impression of a blind man trying to describe colors. On February the 13th, 1945, it comes to a head in the Reich Chancellery. Colonel General Heinz Guderian demands that an experienced general be placed at Himmler's side. Hitler was a choleric personality who had great difficulty dealing with any opposition. And he naturally tried to convince his generals of a reality which they found difficult to dispute with objective arguments and then somehow just accepted it. But Hitler was perverse and stubbornly clung to certain issues, which in the long run ultimately meant that the war was lost, which is what he didn't want to hear. The army chief of staff at the time, Heinz Guderian, was also choleric, and these two gentlemen clashed royally. Guderian was a man who didn't let Hitler tell him what to do. They swore at each other like troopers. After a two-hour exchange, the dictator is beside himself, clenching his fists and flushed with anger. But Guderian stands his ground and finally prevails. As almost every day, Hitler inspects a model of the reconstruction plans for Linz, which was built especially for him in the Reich Chancellery. This is where he'd grown up and where he planned to retire with Eva Braun after the final victory. But deep down, he knows that nothing will come of it. Hitler knew that he would die by his own hand. Eva Braun had already made that clear years ago and had said to her mother many years before, when he is no longer Führer, then I will cease to exist. Basically, they had already planned their deaths. The only question was when. Eva Braun has been at Hitler's side for 13 years. In order to keep this from the German people, she avoids publicity at all costs. Officially, she works as a housekeeper at the Obersalzberg mountain resort near Berchtesgaden. Against the will of her, she came to Berlin from Bavaria in November 1944 and moved into an apartment in the Reich Chancellery. Eva Braun is still celebrating. She's planning a party for her 33rd birthday. That's understandable in principle. But these are people who'd virtually put an end to their lives. At least she, Hitler, and some others. They knew it couldn't go on. So why not have another party? Eva Braun has made a will and bid farewell to her family and friends in Munich. 13th of February, 1945, 84 days before war's end, almost 800 British bombers set course for Dresden. The crews have been told that the air raid will serve to destroy major transportation routes and assist the Red Army. No mention is made of the many refugees sheltering in the city. Stalin was um, concerned, and in fact, at the Yalta conference, there was again request from Antonov of the Stavka that uh, targeting the uh, main railway link-ups uh, was important and a high priority for them. And that is one of the reasons why Chemnitz, Leipzig and Dresden uh, were picked as targets uh, during that particular period. At 21.45, an air raid siren resonates through Dresden. Three quarters of an hour later, from a height of six kilometers, an automatic camera films the dropping of high explosive and incendiary bombs. This time, there are no targeted strikes. Dresden is to be extensively destroyed. Within 15 minutes, the inner city is in flames. The next day, the US Air Force attacks with its flying fortresses. Then came one attack wave after the next, four in all within about two days. 
And there were more bombs dropped on Dresden than at any time on any German city, mainly incendiary bombs. That was the most devastating. Within a very short time, three quarters of Dresden's old town was completely destroyed. Most brutal was the fire that spread so quickly. Those who fled to the air aid shelters, some of which were poorly ventilated, may well have suffocated. Those outside were sucked into the fire, hurled through the air, virtually melted on the street and had little chance of survival. An internal report four weeks later puts the number of bodies recovered at 18,375 and the total number of casualties at 25,000. Nazi propaganda announces a much higher number to the press in neutral countries. A Swedish newspaper reports up to 200,000 casualties in Dresden. The official reaction from Great Britain Dresden was, in reality, a bunch of munitions factories and a major transport hub. But it isn't anymore. Criticism got stronger after the end of the war, uh, not actually during the war. Um, and it was really only uh, once the war was over and it became clear that there had been a significant number of civilian uh, refugees also holed up in Dresden, that it became clear that the damage had not just been to military installations, but also to the civilian population. In the summer of 1945, an amateur filmmaker is shooting in demolished Dresden. Pictures like these substantiate the myth of a devastated city that was senselessly destroyed. March 3rd, 1945, 66 days before war's end. With its concrete dragon teeth, the Siegfried Line near Aachen secures the border of Nazi Germany. On this, the 3rd of March, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill sets foot in Hitler's Reich for the first time. Churchill was, of course, a deeply serious man in many ways, but there was also something of an overgrown public schoolboy in him and he wanted to demonstrate his hatred of Hitler and the fact that he despised everything that he stood for by, well, by peeing on the Western Wall, the secret line defences. It's the British Field Marshal. Alan Brooke recorded in his diaries that um, a great sense of relief and satisfaction spread over Churchill's face. Uh, as he contemplated what he had just achieved. Allied troops are advancing towards the Rhine. The Germans have mined their lines of defense at Duren and Ulich, thus hindering the American advance. The US Air Force bombs the way clear with massive strikes. Only ruins remain of the city of Ulich. Also, Losses in this section of the front are high. Cameramen of the US Signal Corps accompany the advance. A team is on site in Neulich on the 3rd of March 1945 to document the visit of the Commander-in-Chief. Dwight D. Eisenhower detests the Germans for all the misery they have wrought upon the world. And also, while he is compelled to bomb their cities and continue the bloody war, Eisenhower is determined to liberate the country, even against the will of its inhabitants. The Western Allies certainly want to do their bit in terms of defeating Germany, and they want to get to the heart of Germany as quickly as possible. I think in terms of morale, it's a terrific boost, of course, for the, the Western Allies. And so this is the, the first big push in the West uh, at a time when the Soviets are not actually pushing forwards towards Berlin, so they're still stuck uh, east of the Oder. The Red Army offensive is making slow progress in the north. The Soviet front line runs along the Oder and Nysa rivers. In Poznan, the defenders are forced to surrender. The difficulty of conquering those cities declared fortresses by the Nazis 
is shown by this footage of Poznan. The city has been hit by massive artillery fire for weeks. Soviet soldiers then advance, street by street, and drive the Germans from their positions in bloody door-to-door -door combat. Only after four weeks of fierce battle do the defenders capitulate. Beyond the Oder waits the last Wehrmacht contingent. Its offensive against the Red Army has foundered. On this, the 3rd of March, 1945, 66 days before the German surrender, Adolf Hitler visits his troops. Actually, an excellent opportunity to finally end the war with an assassination attempt on the commander-in-chief. The German generals, I must remember, were a beholden to Hitler partly because of their promotions, their medals, and above all the bribery to uh, many of them with large amounts of cash and even estates. And therefore, they were not in a position really to oppose Hitler. Um, and frankly, there was a complete lack of moral as well as even physical courage uh, on their part when uh, it was a question of standing up really for their own troops and their own formations. Nothing happens when the dictator leaves the barracks near Neuhardenberg at 5 p.m. He returns with his retinue to the Reich Chancellery in Berlin. He will never leave it alive. On this, the 3rd of March, 1945, a US camera team is shooting in Neuss. After the Nazi party bosses flee, the city is surrendered without a fight. As a young woman writes in her diary, here, we have probably already survived the worst, but we have undergone some terrible things in the last few months. It soon became unbearable. The poor people who must continue to endure. When will it all come to an end? The Allies' goal of taking the Rhine bridges near Dusseldorf intact fails. On this day, the Germans blow up the bridges. 66 days still remain until war's end. 